Working with DNA is the bread and butter for molecular biologists, and PCR is one of the most common techniques in the lab. It's taught in science at schools across every level of education, and is casually referenced by every fictional doctor or detective you see on TV. It seems like we all know about PCR, but what do we know really? If you were asked to explain how PCR works in an exam, what would you say? And if I asked you to set up a PCR experiment on your first day in a new lab, what would you need to make that happen? Hello, my name is Jack Wayne, and I'm a microbiologist and science educator based in Australia. Today, we'll examine polymerase chain reaction by walking through and explaining an interactive PCR experiment step-by-step in the lab. At its core, PCR is designed to make many copies of DNA very quickly. In this example, we are working with a new bacterial strain, which may be resistant to many different antibiotics. We can extract genomic DNA from the bacteria and run a PCR to see if we can detect any antibiotic resistance genes in its genome. We can then visualize the PCR products through gel electrophoresis. For a PCR to work, you need a few key ingredients, an enzyme buffer to establish the right conditions for the reaction, DNTPs, individual building block nucleotides of DNA, A, T, C, and G, used to synthesize your gene of interest, primers made up of oligonucleotides that will bind to the start and end of your target gene's DNA sequence, a DNA polymerase enzymes that will use the DNTPs to extend and copy DNA starting from the primers that have bound to the template, which in this case is genomic DNA from our bacteria. Here are the standard concentrations for reagents we need. The original or stock concentrations, as well as the final concentrations in the PCR reaction tube. The total reaction volume for a PCR that we will use is 50 microliters, so the volume of each reagent needs to be adjusted in the right proportions to match this final volume. To do this, we can use the C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2 formula. We know C1, stock concentration, C2, the desired final concentration, and V2, our final volume of 50 microliters in each reaction. A bit of algebra, and we can calculate V1, the volume of stock reagent that should be added to each 50 microliter PCR reaction. Normally, the minimum number of reactions to set up in one go is three, a negative control without any template DNA, the test reaction with template DNA, and an extra reaction just in case. We multiply all the volumes needed by the number of reactions, so in this case, it's multiplied by three. Our master mix will include every reagent except the template DNA, and this allows us to prepare the same volume of master mix into each reaction tube. This lowers the variability in chemical concentrations across different reaction tubes due to your preparing error. Let's prepare the master mix by first adding the enzyme buffer. Then the DNTPs. Note we're working on ice as much as possible, especially when it comes to the stock reagents that need to be reused. Prepare both the forward and reverse primers into the master mix. Add the right amount of sterile water to make up to the final reaction volume of 50 microliters in every tube for this experiment. We then add the TAC polymerase. And vortex the master mix solution. It's now ready to go. We now set up the PCR reactions. First, a negative control without any template DNA. Then our test reaction where we add the template DNA. The genomic DNA isolated from the new bacterial strain. Once everything is added, we vortex the tubes again before putting the tubes into the thermocycler machine. The thermocycle is programmed for the three phases of a PCR reaction. One, denaturation, melting of the template DNA at high temperatures, 95 degrees Celsius, so that it separates into two separate strands. Two, annealing. We lower the temperature so that the primers designed to bind to your DNA can actually attach to the single-stranded template DNA. This typically happens between 55 to 65 degrees Celsius. The higher the temperature, the more specific the binding. Three, extension. The polymerase enzyme will use the forward and reverse primers as the start and end points and continually incorporate DNTPs in an order dictated by the template DNA sequence. This occurs at a temperature that's best for the DNA polymerase, around 68 degrees Celsius. We we'll repeat these three phases for 25 to 35 cycles, with each cycle doubling the amount of DNA being copied, increasing it exponentially to the point where we can visualize DNA using gel electrophoresis. 
The individual nucleotides that make up the A, T, C, and G bases in DNA have a negatively charged phosphate backbone, making DNA a negatively charged molecule overall. When we load DNA into a jelly-like agarose gel and create an electric field around it, DNA will migrate towards the positively charged end at a speed proportional to its size. The longer the DNA, the slower it will move through the gel, the shorter the DNA, the quicker and further down it will move. We can prepare this agarose gel from scratch to determine the precise thickness and size of the pores in the jelly matrix that DNA can move through. A 1% agarose gel, 1 gram and 100 mils of trisporate EDTA or TBE buffer is what we're setting up, but you can increase or decrease the agarose concentration depending on the size of the DNA bands you're looking for. Smaller band sizes will need a higher percentage agarose gel, although we typically don't go above 2% agarose. You need to repeatedly microwave this solution to melt the agarose about 10 to 20 seconds each time, mixing well to check that all the agarose has melted. The solution should be clear and free of any lumps, and now we can add CyberSafe, a stain that will detect DNA in the gel and glow when exposed to UV light. We pour the solution out on a gel tray sealed on each end with masking tape, Put a comb in the gel tray to create holes in the gel so we can load DNA into different lanes. Once the agarose has set, about 30 minutes at room temp, you can then peel off the tape, load the gel into the electrophoresis tank. We fill the tank up with the buffer, the same TBE buffer used to make the gel. Once your PCR reaction has finished running, we load the samples onto the gel. We need a DNA ladder, a reference set of DNA bands that we know the size of to compare the bands in our PCR reactions. DNA ladders are commercially available and already contain a loading die. The dark bluish purple die that we can see if the DNA samples migrate further down the gel. Our PCR reactions are still completely see-through though at this point, so we need to add a loading die separately to our own reaction samples. We can then load the control and test reaction samples in a separate lane, inserting the tip of the pipette into the top of the lane, taking care not to prepare bubbles into the gel. Some scientists use their offhand to support the pipette and make sure that each sample only goes into one lane on the gel. Now let's attach the anode and cathode onto the tank and start the electrophoresis reaction. Common settings are 120 volts for 30 minutes, but you can adjust this as you go. We see the loading die gradually migrate down the gel, but we still do not know if there are any DNA bands in the different PCR reactions. We can stop the run, remove the gel from the tank, and load it onto a trans illuminator. This platform shines UV light onto the gel, illuminating any DNA bands that have bound to CyberSafe, the DNA stain we previously added to the gel. You can see a number of bands light up on the gel when UV light is turned on, and we can assess the size of these bands relative to the size of known bands on the DNA ladder. In this case, we loaded the DNA ladder in the first lane, the negative control reaction in the second lane, and the test reaction in the third lane. If our gene of interest is approximately one kilo base, 1,000 bases in size, and is found in the genomic DNA, then we should see a one kilo base band present in the third lane, but absent from the second lane. If the bacteria does not contain our gene of interest, you would expect to not see any bands around the one kilo base size in any of your reaction lanes. All of this may feel like a long drawn out process, but PCR gel electrophoresis are only the first step in many experiments. A band may appear to be similar in size to our gene of interest, but have a completely different DNA sequence. We can cut out individual bands from the gel and sequence those bands base by base to verify that it is indeed our gene of interest. Also a gene may be present in an organism's genome, but not expressed in the protein or contribute to its phenotype or function. We can do follow-up experiments in these cases to assess protein expression using techniques like SDS page and Western blotting. You can find Find videos for each of these techniques on this channel via the links in the description below. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.